main conference of the of this congress and it's very very ple it's a huge pleasure uh, to have here uh, Paul Marty. Uh, Paul uh, is a professor in the School of Information and is the Associate Dean of Innovation in the College of Communication and Information of uh, Florida State University. Uh, his research um, and teaching interests include museum informatics, technology and culture, innovation and design, and information and society. It is um, it is important for us to have here, he's going to speak about contributions of museum technology professionals, focusing on those professionals who you are <laughs> during the time of crisis. And uh, in this presentation, he will explore uh, the contributions of uh, museum technology professionals during the crisis and how museum leadership uh, can best take advantage of those contributions. It addresses the following keyword, key questions like how are these contributions viewed by the museum leaders or how can museums technology professional advocate the, the value of the contributions during the crisis uh, situation and how to make this visible. No, Paul, um, I, I lead I lead you here with your presentation. Please uh, proceed. It's a pleasure to having you here this afternoon and to to contribute to the conference. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna, for the kind introduction. That was truly spectacular. And it is a real pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. To bring to for bringing together such a fantastic group of museum professionals to talk about digital strategies, it is truly extraordinary to see how many people uh, have gotten together in this time to have these conversations. I should say that I woke up at five o'clock this morning, my time here in Florida, to listen to Ross Perry talk about empathy, which was spectacular, by the way. So I'm going to try to echo some of Ross's points and my comments now as we think about the people who are working behind the scenes to keep our museums relevant to our communities in times of crisis. And so with that concept of empathy firmly in mind, I feel like I should start my talk by apologizing to you all in advance because I would like to start out by taking us back one year to March 2020. Imagine the COVID-19 pandemic is spreading worldwide. Nation after nation is entering into lockdown. And as this happened, some amazing things happened in the field of museum computing. Museum technology professionals jumped into action, leveraging the power of museum computing to reach audiences and communities who were suddenly unable to visit museums in person or maybe even leave their house. And there were many wonderful examples of projects that stood out in this time. One of my favorites, and you might remember this, was the Getty Art Challenge. This challenge encouraged homebound museum fans to recreate their favorite museum paintings in person, to share them on social media, and hundreds of thousands of people participated in this challenge around the world, taking paintings like Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring and sharing amazing pictures of themselves on social media. This example is a wonderful one. I particularly like the scarf made out of toilet paper. And of course, for many people, they got their family pets involved too. This picture of the cat is spectacular. Now, according to Tim Hart, who was in charge of audience research at the Getty and who presented on this project at the Museum Computer Network Conference in November of 2020, they saw traffic to the Getty Museum website increase in April 2020 by more than 200% as a result of this challenge. And social media engagement, primarily Twitter and Instagram with the museum, increased by more than 1,500% as a direct result of this challenge. 
And that is amazing. That's inspiring. And with the clear success of projects like this challenge, the potential of museum technology professionals to connect their museums with visitors, to make a difference in people's lives, no matter where they are in the world, seemed obvious. And yet, as the pandemic dragged on and museum budgets went from bad to worse, museum technology professionals often found themselves first on the chopping block to be fired. Why? Zachary Small, writing in Artnet News last year, wrote that budget shortfalls have resulted in a regression of priorities for museums, where once growing fields like digital media and education are being targeted for cuts. Similarly, the American Alliance of Museums during summer of 2020 did a sur survey and they found that despite the obvious value of online experiences from museum visitors, two thirds of museums in the United States were cutting education, programming, and other public services. Now, as you can imagine, these decisions frustrated many museum technology professionals at the time. This tweet, by Max Evgen at Michigan State University in summer 2020 is an excellent example of what people were saying online. Those are the museum professionals needed now. If you are laying off furloughing them, you are doing it wrong. Now granted, we have to face reality. And given the dire financial situation that resulted from the pandemic, cuts of course were unavoidable. But I would argue that museums have weathered crises before and survived. The 2008 economic crisis, for example, not while well, not as bad as 2020, devastated museums worldwide, but museums eventually recovered, some coming back stronger than ever. And as the International Council of Museums observed in 2013, reflecting on that crisis, said that museums strengthen cultural identities, support social cohesion, develop intercultural mediation, all activities that are fundamental in times of crisis. So as a result, I would argue that it is precisely in times of crisis when we need to think carefully about the decisions we are making about our personnel and what those decisions say about our priorities regarding museum technology and working with new media to reach new audiences. And especially what those decisions say about the people who work with technology. What message are we sending to museum technology workers when a museum administrators say, well, sure, things are bad, but at least we haven't had to fire any curators? What message do we send when museum leaders separate out curators as essential staff and non-curators as non-essential staff who perform non-core functions, as many museums argued during the crisis? Or when museum leaders say that they cannot wait until their galleries reopen and the museum can get back to its core audience, which decidedly does not include online communities. What is our long-term strategic thinking here? Where is the human element of museum computing? Who is going to carry us forward into our precarious future? As Ross mentioned this morning, who's going to help us make sense of the post-digital meta-modern world in which we now live? Who is going to lead the way to reshape the museum's identity in the future? Can we not learn from our past to plan for our future? Instead of firing the very people who are best able to help us weather crises, can we not recognize the role that museum professionals play in those situations? In short, how do we stop doing it wrong? So to explore the contributions of museum technology professionals during these crisis times, and to talk about how museum leaders can best take advantage of those contributions, this talk, as Anna mentioned in the introduction, is, is addressing four key questions. And this leads me to the first of those questions, how can museum technology professionals contribute? Well, we all know, and you're talking about this in many sessions at this conference, that there are many ways 
that technology professionals can contribute to museums in times of crisis, particularly in situations where audiences might be unable to visit museums in person. When we look at audience engagement, digital media, online outreach, all ways that museums have the opportunity to reach out and remain relevant to their communities at a distance. And in particular, when crises force museums to close their doors to the public, the more we can provide access to information online, reach new audiences through new media, engage those audiences with interactive online activities, the more those become critically important activities for museum professionals. And this is especially the case as more and more visitors expect museums to offer those types of interactions as part of the museum experience. And those expectations are a key point. I love this quote from Suze Anderson in a wonderful chapter in the Rutledge Handbook of Museums, Media, and Communication, where she argues that the use of new technologies within these processes is increasingly important for reconceptualizing museum visitors and audiences, particularly as media becomes more firmly woven in the people's lives and museum experiences. And it is so important that we understand how those media interactions are being taken for granted by our audiences. And the external, the external communications that we have. So for example, the ability to provide remote access to information about the museum's collections, offers all kinds of new opportunities for museum professionals to interact with their visitors outside the museum, and offering the potential to turn one-way synchronous on-site interactions into two-way asynchronous interactions that can take place anywhere in the world. Similarly, the opportunity to engage museum audiences with online activities that are relevant to them in their everyday lives offers museums the chance to expand their reach into new communities, including reaching out to individuals who quite likely would never before have interacted with the museum, whether or not there was a crisis. There are also, I would argue, important internal interactions that museum technology professionals can contribute particularly situations where their expertise with information and communication technologies can be most useful. So for example, when we think about supporting the technical infrastructure that underlies the museum operations, the very technology that among other things allows many museum professionals to work from home, when we think about safeguarding the integrity of the museum's information resources, information systems, these are critically important roles for technology professionals to play. It's also extremely likely that museum technology professionals will be involved in developing and maintaining the museum's strategic plan for digital operations, and quite likely even adapting the strategic plan on the fly as crises evolve, and even more likely probably developing a strategic plan for their institution at the last minute if there was no strategic plan before as we heard a lot in 2020, talking to museum professionals about how their institutions responded to the crisis. Many of them said, I have been begging for years, please let me develop a digital strategic plan. And they were told no, then the crisis hit and their bosses turned to them and said, why don't we have a digital strategic plan? Now we have one. The ability of these individuals to provide access to information, to engage audience, maybe even to document the way that the museum responded to the crisis over time, to meet information needs inside and outside the museum during these situations, critically important for museums in the digital age. And as the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded, museum after museum looked around for employees, help them implement the very digital strategies that they needed to survive this crisis. And it was the museum technology professionals who developed these strategies, who built this infrastructure, who promoted, let's say, the necessary digital mindset for the museum to succeed. But how obvious was this? How clear? were these contributions? Were these people 
even seen. It's imperative that these contributions be clearly documented and clarified for all stakeholders. Because if the museum technology professionals are going to be recognized in a way that can help museums we uh, weather further crises, then these contributions have to be clearly denoted. Which takes me to the second question. How are these contributions viewed by museum leadership? We know that these contributions have the potential to be extremely valuable and extremely useful for museums. But we also know that technology professionals working in museums are an awful lot like technology professionals writ large in any organization. They quite often struggle to make the value of their contributions apparent to leadership often due to a general lack of understanding about the nature of technology projects and the wide ranging responsibilities that they have. And this is a problem. The more the behind the scenes work of museum technology professionals goes unseen, unsupported, invisible to museum leadership, the more these struggles are likely to pose a danger to museums in crisis. I've always loved this quote from Bonnie Nardi. She talks here about how when organizations are restructured and work is reorganized, invisible but valuable work is often eliminated. Why? Because no one recognizes it is being done or that it is of value, so time and personnel are not allotted in new plans to maintain it. This is the invisibility of technology work, and I've talked in written a lot about this over the past decade or so, it's a really big concern of mine with respect to the museum technology profession. The inherent invisibility of the behind the scenes work of museum technology professionals often can result in the perception that museum technology workers are not essential to museum operations. After all, it is very easy to discount what you don't see. And almost all technology workers abide by the maxim that if something is visible, that means something is broken. We live in a world where a properly functioning infrastructure means that infrastructure is invisible. And that inherent invisibility of our work often goes hand in hand with common misconceptions about the everyday roles and responsibilities of the profession. And the more that work remains invisible, the more likely it is that museum leaders will undervalue those digital initiatives. Now, throughout 2020, it was interesting to attend conferences and talk to museum technology professionals because recent events really have raised a kind of hope that their work has become a lot more visible just in the past nine months. Think back to the Art Getty Art Challenge, for example. But even as museum leaders are calling upon museum technology workers to support their institutions during this pandemic, there has remained an underlying fear among museum technology professionals that these gains would be short-lived. Many, many worried that keeping a spotlight on museum technology projects post-pandemic would be challenging because of the inherent misconceptions about and misunderstandings of technology work in museums. And there are a lot of potential common misunderstandings that underlie our perceptions of technology work. There is, for instance, the general misunderstanding about the lack of time and effort that museum technology projects require which can result in really a mistaken belief that technology projects are overly expensive and provide very little return on investment. It's not true, but it's a common belief. There's also the general misunderstanding about the responsibilities of technology professionals in museums, and that's often compounded by the difficulty of conveying tangible indicators of success in technology projects. And that is even more particularly true in situations where the lessons that we learn from failure can be a lot more valuable than the results of a successful technology project. And yet, despite that, we find many institutions outsourcing projects to someone else so that the museum ends up with a, with a 
finished product that will likely be obsolete in a year anyway, but does not the de develop the in-house knowledge and expertise that is the true value that you get from working on those projects. Likewise, we have the mistaken perception that online outreach does not contribute directly to museum visits. We know that there has been a great use of metrics for defining success in the digital world. Uh, that looks only at in-person visits, a metric that has continued to defy decades of arguments, but that can result also in a tendency to undervalue museum work when compared with other, museum technology work, sorry, when compared with other museum activities. I often talk about this with our library science students at Florida State University. For a museum or for a library, this will be like a library only counting the books that circulate as a measure of the library's impact on a community. If you only look at the books that are checked out, you miss 90% of the library's role. And the worry we have now is that many people will say that now that the pandemic is behind us, we can ignore the changes we have made to technology. We can get back to a world where the only things that matter are the experiences people have in the museum. And if we think that way, then we've lost a tremendous amount of progress. That is not how you reach a billion people around the world as the Smithsonian Institution challenged their museums to do in their relatively new strategic plan a few years ago. We need to reach people where they are. We need to look at the museum in the lives of our visitors and not the other way around. And that kind of outward thinking is where the museum technology profession lives. And so if the lessons that we learn from this pandemic are not to be lost, then the museum technology sector has to become much better at advocating for its work so that museum leaders will be more likely to prioritize digital initiatives in the future. And that takes us to the next question. How can technology professionals better advocate the value of their contributions? We have to be our own advocates here. We need to be able to advocate as strongly as possible how we contribute, not just in times of crisis, but in times of stability. And we can do that by involving museum leaders with the ongoing work of the museum technology profession and working to demonstrate our value as a professional community. It is imperative that we take every opportunity to document our work, provide evidence about its benefits for museums, especially in a world where invisible work that takes place behind the scenes can be all too often taken for granted. We need to help museum leaders and museum stakeholders see the human face of museum computing. And here I'm going to quote one of my own papers, <laughs> something I wrote a few years back, which I think is, is, is very important, that as long as people believe that their easy access to your collections just magically appeared, no thanks to your invisible work, there is always the danger that someone will ask, why are you important? What were your contributions? Who are you anyway? It's not magic elves working behind the scenes here, making our collections available. It's real live people who need real live support. We desperately need to put a human face on museum computing. This connects with Ross Perry's talk this morning about empathy. This is about building empathy for a community of museum technology professionals. And we can do this in many ways. We can fight against a trend that makes museum professionals unseen by trying to take those behind the scenes day-to-day -day activities and bring them out to the forefront. We can proactively share examples of successful technology projects with broader audiences. Remember, a project that isn't shared easily turns into a project that no one knows about, which pretty much equals a project that didn't happen. We can 
provide metrics that document the ability of technologies to enhance audience engagement activities. We can help museum professionals demonstrate the value and the connections between online outreach and in-person visits. We can help museum professionals work more closely with museum leadership to discuss digital strategies, new approaches to solving technology problems. The more that museum technology professionals can work with museum leadership directly to involve them in technology projects and to encourage them to take the initiative, say by documenting the need for or the value of a digital strategic plan, the more we're going to be able to advocate for our contributions during times of crisis. Likewise, another powerful tool is for museum technology professionals to join forces with other workers at other museums by enlisting the help of professional organizations, by getting together at conferences just like this to document and disseminate data about the value of museum technology work. The more evidence that we can provide about the value of the contributions of technology professionals to museums, the more they will be able to increase their overall understanding and visibility. Again, throughout the pandemic, museum technology professionals stepped forward and demonstrated time and again their ability to keep museums open in the eyes of their visitors, available and functioning for the employees who were engaged in remote work and relevant in their distributed communities. And it is critically important that these accomplishments not go unnoticed. The more we can provide evidence of the effectiveness of these efforts and the value of this work, the more opportunities that we have for museum leaders to promote and invest in the contributions of their staff. And that is critically important because the future of museums depends on those investments. And that takes us to the final question. How can museum leaders and museum technology professionals work together to develop the skills, the mindset, the strategies that everyone's going to need to meet new challenges and survive new crises? We know that there is a clear need for museum leaders to invest in the digital literacies digital strategies, digital thinking necessary to navigate crises in the 21st century. Think about Ross Perry's comments this morning about the meta-modern moment in which we live. In our post-digital meta-modern world where digital pervades everything, there is no future in museums. There's no future for museums that do not have employees with the skills, the strategic thinking, the mindset that museums are going to need to survive. And let me be clear, this is not about specific tools or specific technologies. This is about strategic thinking that will enable museums to transform using technology to reach a new, more human-centered future. As museums move forward into a post-COVID world, we should not try to go back to the old normal. We cannot go back to the old normal. Normal was a problem for many people. We need to take the lessons we have learned from this forced experiment in online engagement and work from home and move forwards, not backwards. We need to focus on the possibilities of using technology to reshape the museum experience, to search for a new normal that is going to be better for all museum professionals, to rethink the role of museums. I would posit that it is time for museum leaders to recognize that technology professionals are as essential as curators to the operation of the modern museum. And it is time for museum leaders to recognize that those individuals are uniquely positioned to provide the kind of digital leadership that all museums need, but few museums have during crisis situations. There was a recent study from the Knight Foundation that was published just this past fall that showed exactly how far we have to go. A couple of quick quotes. The Knight Foundation reported that as more museums begin to make digital audience engagement a priority, the need for digitally focused staff will increase, but, all, but half of the institutions surveyed report having none or just a single digital staff member. Similarly, they also found that leaders agreed that they have to make it a priority 
for their institutions to build a digital mindset. Yet across all museums, only 11% had digital leaders as part of their senior management team. And that is a critical error on the part of many museums. It is so important that we encourage our professionals to develop skills and areas like content management and digital literacy, user experience, information ethics, information security. These are the big picture skills. These are the big picture skills that are going to be critically important and going to shape our thinking. We, the user experience, we cannot create resources with studying how they're used or assessing the needs of the, of the audiences we're building them for. And let me just point out here that societally informed information policy is, I believe, right now, the only thing standing between us and the collapse of democracy. And we have to bring these skills in the leadership positions in museums. Because remember, these are not skills about specific technologies, but about integrating digital thinking, strategic thinking into the museum. Now, fortunately, there are many professional organizations and academic groups working to develop these skills to address this skills gap. I was delighted that Ross talked about the one by one project this morning. But unfortunately, no matter how enthusiastically museums might embrace this new normal, one of the biggest problems that we face today is the difficulty that museums have in hanging on to skilled technology professionals. Once again, we are back to the people. This is a brilliant quote from Seb Chan, who wrote a spectacular Medium post in late 2020. If you haven't read this Medium post, I highly recommend it if you want to understand the problems facing museum technology today. He wrote, with the massive exodus of skilled technical talent from the sector, there are too few people with the depth and in-sector experience to help museums make sensible strategic technology choices. And he is exactly right. If we're going to change these problems, we have to look beyond the tech skills to look at the human face of museum computing to find out what is driving people away and how can we retain them. You can outsource technology skills, but you cannot outsource empathy. You cannot outsource emotion. You cannot outsource the knowledge of the people in the profession who make the museum a museum. This is about emphasizing the importance of people in museum technology. If museums are going to change this, then instead of firing the very people who are best situated to help museums make strategic choices, museums are going to have to embrace the digital literacies of their employees and increase their investment in the people who know how to use those technologies to shape what our museum is going to look like in our post-digital meta-modern world. In order for museums to stop doing it wrong, then museum leaders, museum technology professionals all have to work together to meet future challenges successfully. And if we can encourage a shared understanding of the contributions of the technology profession, then I think museums will be better positioned to have the people who have the digital skills, who have the people-centered mindset, who have the strategic thinking that all museums are going to need to succeed in the future. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Paul. It's been very clear. I think we now uh, can claim to those uh, leaders of the museum to rethink, rethink and maybe reconsider some issues and make visible our work, of, of course. Uh, I was wondering a question and then I saw that uh, is there on the chat. Uh, Concha Roda also thought about it. And this question is, uh, she's saying the pandemic has probably made obvious that digital skills are needed not just for a few, but across the whole museum. Don't you think so, Paul? That is not before was maybe an issue of the informatics people or the social media, but now also the people from conservation, the library also need to know about informatics. How is this working? 
Uh, that's exactly right. Everybody has to develop, um, if not the tools, or the, the, an understanding of the specific tools and technologies, those are going to vary from job to job, but everybody has to have that strategic thinking to understand the role that digital is playing in the museum. That can't be allocated to one department or one individual, because what happens then, just like that quote from the Knight Foundation, that person's not brought into the higher level thinking. They're rarely there in the C-suite. They're rarely there working with the leaders. Everybody has to have that mindset. We have to encourage everyone to understand that, that you can't have a museum right now without these digital experiences. So this is a this is a big this is a big problem that the museum technology community has argued about over the the years. Uh, Rob Stein has written a lot about this as well. If you know Rob Stein's work, whether or not there should be a separate part of the museum that's focused on digital, whether or not everybody should be focused on digital, the role of the strategic plan and making all of this clear. The one thing that makes me worry harkens back to the invisible work uh, aspect. If no one person is in charge of digital. If everybody is responsible for digital, then you could also say that then, well, nobody is in charge of digital and it could be easy for it to get left behind in, uh, in strategic thinking. Hmm. Okay, thank you. That's a good answer. Also, Javier, it's saying, uh, could you please share with us uh, some metrics or K KPIs? Uh, we can take to take into consideration in order to prove, uh, sorry, smooth our in order to prove our work vital, as well as effectively proving uh, our institutions. Right, I, I, I'm going to unpack that into two separate things. Right, so you've got the return on investment question there at the end, which is a really difficult one because so much of the return on investment of technology projects is not the end product and this is a very hard thing for museum leaders to grasp um I, let me ask this I, does anybody remember the online multi-user virtual environment called second life it's hmm. still around i don't know if people remember that <laughs> <laughs> right back in the day Many museums were developing virtual, online, virtual reality exhibits in Second Life. And people would say to me, is that worth the investment of our time? Are we going to get a return on our investment? And what I would say to them is, if you're looking for that platform to be your return on the investment, then no, because that platform's probably not going to be here five years from now. Or if it is, probably no one's going to be using it. But if you think about investing in the skills of your staff, virtual reality is not going away. So the more skills that your staff can develop in building these platforms, you see what I'm saying? The project itself is not the important thing. The project is probably going to be outdated five years from now and no longer of use. It's what you learn while working on the project that are the valuable skills. But mm -hmm. those, those are intangible. Right. So how do you measure that? How do you demonstrate that return on investment in the in the staff? Right. Yeah. And in terms of the metrics to prove that your work is vital, this really, again, gets to this problem where the people who are in administrative roles tend not to understand the technology. So they ask for metrics that may not make a lot of sense and that in many ways tend to frustrate the museum profession, uh, sorry, the museum technology profession. How many times have you been told it doesn't matter how many people visit our website, what matters is how many people walk in the door, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to shift that way of thinking. Social media is another good example. I've had long conversations with social media managers about this problem, where when many of them started working on social media in museums, they said, this is amazing. We can think about how we engage our audiences, make a difference in their lives, bring the museum out of the galleries and into their personal lived experiences. But when push comes to shove, when they're asked to justify their existence, they need to document how many times was this tweet retweeted? How many Facebook followers do you have? How many times did you post to Twitter in any given day? Right? Those metrics don't actually connect with the the goals we're trying to achieve 
and this is across the board. You should look at the metrics we're asked to do in academia, right? What we measure is very rarely related to what we're trying to do. So we need to get the upper administration, the leaders in museums to actually try to measure the right thing. And the only way to do that is to get a seat at the table and explain to them what's going on with digital strategies in museums. Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions. A few more questions. Uh, Pilar is saying, do you know how many professionals of technology are working in the states museums, on the museums from the states and uh, in Spain? <laughs> do we know how many uh, professionals we have specialized in technology or digital? Is that role uh, characterized especially? Maybe in the states is more than Spain? We don't know. Sure. Well, first of all, I mean, as you can imagine, th these are jobs that cut across many different classifications, right? Um, are you more technology focused? Are you a web developer? Are you, you know, all the, all the way down the line? Um, we've uh, Ross talked this morning about the sort of evolution of technology in museums. That as we went from technology being a tool to technology being a um, a medium for content delivery to technology being a, a, an environment, a, a milieu in which we in which we live, the mm -hmm. jobs have transformed over those times as well. Mm -hmm. One of the best ways to look at these communities is to look at events like this and see who self selects to come to this kind of event? Who defines themselves as wanting to know about uh, museum technology? So for example, in the United States of America, I think Ross talked about it this morning, the Museum Computer Network is an excellent organization, meets annually, has lots of online stuff happening throughout the year. They usually have about four or 500 people who come to those annual conferences. Now, one of the challenges though, is that out of those 400 people, 50% of them are new every year. The okay. turnover in museum technology is incredible because, and this goes back to the point, the, the quote I had from Seb Chan, right? Mm -hmm. Not only are museums terrible at keeping technology professionals, but other institutions are better at stealing them away. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember a lot of people who work in this field could double their salary, could triple their salary by going to a non-museum institution mm -hmm. and doing the same work, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we keep that knowledge in the institution? <laughs> because they have this experience and maybe they have other knowledges. Okay, one more question and it's linked uh, of those two people, Julieta and Isabel. Isabel is saying, and it's a very interesting question because uh, I, le uh, we, I lead the uh, REMED, this network of museums professionals, and normally are small museums, uh, the ones who have those problems. So Julieta is asking, what are the skills a digital professional should have and what kind of training should those interests be uh, to acquire? And, uh, no, sorry, Julieta is saying that and Isabel is saying, in a small museum, what are the needs of digital uh, that a professional should have? If there is only one person to do that, maybe, or what are the, the needs, uh, those of you, and Isabel? Right. This is a, this is, this is a, this is a big problem. Um, I can remember talking about this problem with Loic Talon back when he was in charge of uh, digitization at the, at the Metropolitan Museum, right? So at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, they have 200 people working in their technology offices, 200. In a small museum, you're lucky if you have one person, like that Knight Foundation survey showed. So. Mm -hmm. You're comparing apples and oranges there, right? So if you're the small, if you're the person in charge of technology in a small museum, you have to wear up to a hundred hats. Right? You have to be able to solve immediate problems that often leave very little time for the long-term strategic thinking. So the, 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 this feeds into the question about the skills. This is the same thing that I tell our information technology students at the university. Your technical skills are going to get you your job, but your management skills are going to get you your career. And you should look at the technology as a way of getting your foot in the door. Because if we don't have people working in museums who understand the bigger picture questions about the importance of user experience research, the importance of data ethics and information privacy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Think about GDPR, right? Think about information security. Think about information policy. Um, I've talked to way, way too many museum directors who said, I hired this person because I needed them to build me a database or build me a system or build me a website. But what I did not understand is that the information system that person built was going to change the culture of my museum, right? Because the underlying system that we use shapes the way the museum works. Hmm. So if you hire someone only who only has the tech skills, great, you'll have a database but does it support the way you work? Do you like the way it changes the museum? This is what you think of as a technology problem is actually a policy problem. What you think of as a systems problem is actually a people problem. So it's a very difficult world in which to live where you need those technology skills, but the social impact of those technologies is the most important thing that's going to happen. Yeah. And then the last question Maria is saying, and just for concluding, because we, we have the round table, and it's saying, what do you think it has to be the relationship between the worker, the digital employee in the museum and the humanities, uh, and how this could be re re rela related and linked, no? Those uh, hum humanistic uh, file of the person or, or the employee, and also this technological file, and this is the last one. <laughs> right, exactly. Now, I'm assuming by humanities there, you're talking about like maybe subject area experts, like art historians, things like that? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, Either the problem that we come down to is there has to be a shared understanding on both sides. We've we've seen tremendous growth in that over the past few decades. Uh, back to the Met, for example, as late as the 1990s, they were extremely reluctant to have any technology in the galleries at all because there was a wall. Technology was not something that we did. Uh, mm -hmm. on the curatorial side. We're mm -hmm. slowly chipping away at that wall to help people understand those connections. And that that feedback goes both ways. We have to have people who can bridge that, uh, that, that mm -hmm. gap. Um, I've had a number of master's students in our degree program here at Florida State who come to us with a master's of art history. They take their master's in art history, they take their master's in information science, and they can help bridge those communities in a museum because they can speak those languages. The, the last thing we want is for the technology professional to be dismissive of the needs of the art historian or for the art historian to be dis dismissive of the skills of the technology professional. And we've come a long way to bridging those, the, bridging mm -hmm. that gap. And I think that's critically important for the future of museums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or we are our, our orchestra men and like doing everything at the same time. No? Right. <laughs> and we should do that normally. So please, uh, I'm afraid we don't have any time left for more questions. It's been a real pleasure to have you here, Paul. And please uh, continue with us in the chat, whatever it is. I'm sorry, everything is in Spanish, but uh, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. The picture is now much more clear <laughs> what we have to do, how to work, how to contribute, and especially in times of crisis. No, I think you've said very important things to consider. Now it's time to reconsider some issues, to rethink what the role should be, to make decisions, to change uh, the, the leader's mental chips, and then um, to see what, what really uh, are, what, what is the role of the museum in the post-digital modern world, as <laughs> you say, and, and this, uh, this experience, how this experience could be in the future. So uh, we need now, because we have a round table of um, possibility, the future of museums and what are the, the role in, with technology um, elements and so on. So please uh, let us three, four minutes to change the speakers and come back uh, soon with this uh, round table. Thank you, Paul, Marty. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um,